part one chapter one of lady byron vindicated a history of the byron controversy from its beginning in eighteen sixteen to the present time by harriet beecher stowe published in eighteen seventy this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana publisher's preface and chapter one introduction note by the publishers the subject of this volume is of such painful notoriety that any apology from the publishers may seem unnecessary upon issuing the author's reply to the counter statements which her narrative in macmillan's magazine has called forth nevertheless they consider it right to state that their strong regard for the author respect for her motives and assurance of her truthfulness would in the absence of all other considerations be sufficient to induce them to place their imprint on the title page the publication has been undertaken by them at the author's request as her friends and as the publishers of her former works and from a feeling that whatever difference of opinion may be entertained respecting the author's judiciousness in publishing the true story she is entitled to defend it having been treated with grave injustice and often with maliciousness by her critics and opponents and been charged with motives from which no person living is more free an intense love of justice and hatred of oppression with an utter disregard of her own interests characterize mrs stowe's conduct and writings as all who know her well will testify and the publishers can unhesitatingly affirm their belief that neither fear for loss of her literary fame nor hope of gain has for one moment influenced her in the course she has taken london samson lowe son and marston january eighteen seventy chapter one introduction the interval since the publication of my article the true story of lady byron's life has been one of stormy discussion and of much invective i have not thought it necessary to disturb my spirit and confuse my sense of right by even an attempt at reading the many abusive articles that both here and in england have followed that disclosure friends have undertaken the task for me giving me from time to time the substance of anything really worthy of attention which came to view in the tumult it appeared to me essential that this first excitement should in a measure spend itself before there would be a possibility of speaking to any purpose now when all would seem to have spoken who can speak and it is to be hoped have said the utmost they can say there seems a propriety in listening calmly if that be possible to what i have to say in reply and first why have i made this discourse at all to this i answer briefly because i considered it my duty to make it i made it in defence of a beloved revered friend whose memory stood forth in the eyes of the civilised world charged with the most repulsive crimes of which i certainly knew her innocent i claim and shall prove that lady byron's reputation has been the victim of a concerted attack begun by her husband during her lifetime and coming to its climax over her grave i claim and shall prove that it was not i who stirred up this controversy in the year eighteen sixty nine i shall show who did do it and who is responsible for bringing on me that hard duty of making these disclosures which it appears to me ought to have been made by others i claim that these facts were given to me unguarded by any promise or seal of secrecy expressed or implied that they were lodged with me as one sister rests her story with another for sympathy for counsel for defence never did i suppose the day would come that i should be subjected to so cruel an anguish as this use of them has been to me never did i suppose that when those kind hands that had shed nothing but blessings were lying in the helplessness of death when that gentle heart so sorely tried and to the last so full of love was lying cold in the tomb a countryman in england could be found to cast the foulest slanders upon her grave 
and not one in all england to raise an effective voice in her defence i admit the feebleness of my plea in point of execution it was written in a state of exhausted health when no labour of the kind was safe for me when my hand had not strength to hold the pen and i was forced to dictate to another i have been told that i had no reason to congratulate myself on it as a literary effort oh my brothers and sisters is there then nothing in the world to think of but my literary efforts i ask any man with a heart in his bosom if he had been obliged to tell a story so cruel because his mother's grave gave no rest from slander i ask any woman who had been forced to such a disclosure to free a dead sister's name from grossest insults whether she would have thought of making this work of bitterness a literary success are the cries of the oppressed the gasps of the dying the last prayers of mothers are any words wrung like drops of blood from the human heart to be judged as literary efforts my fellow countrymen of america men of the press i have done you one act of justice of all your bitter articles i have read not one i shall never be troubled in the future time by the remembrance of any unkind word you have said of me for at this moment i recollect not one i had such faith in you such pride in my countrymen as men with whom above all others the cause of woman was safe and sacred that i was at first astonished and incredulous at what i heard of the course of the american press and was silent not merely from the impossibility of being heard but from grief and shame but reflection convinces me that you were in many cases acting from a misunderstanding of facts and through misguided honourable feeling and i still feel courage therefore to ask from you a fair hearing now as i have done you this justice will you also do me the justice to hear me seriously and candidly what interest have you or i my brother and my sister in this short life of ours to utter anything but the truth is not truth between man and man and between man and woman the foundation on which all things rest have you not every individual of you who must hereafter give an account yourself alone to god an interest to know the exact truth in this matter and a duty to perform as respects that truth hear me then while i tell you the position in which i stood and what was my course in relation to it a shameless attack on my friend's memory had appeared in blackwood of july eighteen sixty nine branding lady byron as the vilest of criminals and recommending the guiccioli book to a christian public as interesting from the very fact that it was the avowed production of lord byron's mistress no efficient protest was made against this outrage in england and littell's living age reprinted the blackwood article and the harpers the largest publishing house in america perhaps in the world republished the book its statements with those of the blackwood pall mall gazette and other english periodicals were being propagated through all the young reading and writing world of america i was meeting them advertised in dailies and made up into articles in magazines and thus the generation of to-day who had no means of judging lady byron but by these fables of her slanderers were being foully deceived the friends who knew her personally were a small select circle in england whom death is every day reducing they were few in number compared with the great world and were silent i saw these foul slanders crystallizing into history uncontradicted by friends who knew her personally who firm in their own knowledge of her virtues and limited in view as aristocratic circles generally are had no idea of the width of the world they were living in and the exigency of the crisis when time passed on and no voice was raised i spoke i gave at first a simple story for i knew instinctively that whoever put the first steel point of truth into this dark cloud of slander must wait for the storm to spend itself i must say the storm exceeded my expectations and has raged loud and long but now that there is a comparative stillness 
i shall proceed first to prove what i have just been asserting and second to add to my true story such facts and incidents as i did not think proper at first to state this ends chapter one publisher's note and introduction part one chapter two of lady byron vindicated by harriet beecher stowe this librivox recording is in the public domain read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana chapter two the attack on lady byron part one of two in proving what i asserted in the first chapter i make four points first a concerted attack upon lady byron's reputation begun by lord byron in self-defence second that he transmitted his story to friends to be continued after his death third that they did so continue it fourth that the accusations reached their climax over lady byron's grave in blackwood of eighteen sixty nine and the guiccioli book and that this reopening of the controversy was my reasoning for speaking and first i shall adduce my proofs that lady byron's reputation was during the whole course of her husband's life the subject of a concentrated artfully planned attack commencing at the time of the separation and continuing during his life by various documents carefully prepared and used publicly or secretly as suited the case he made converts of many honest men some of whom were writers and men of letters who put their talents at his service during their lifetime in exciting sympathy for him and who by his own request felt bound to continue their defence of him after he was dead in order to consider the force and significance of the documents i shall cite we are to bring to our view just the issues lord byron had to meet both at the time of the separation and for a long time after in byron's memoirs volume four letter three hundred and fifty under date december tenth eighteen nineteen nearly four years after the separation he writes to murray in a state of great excitement on account of an article in blackwood in which his conduct towards his wife had been sternly and justly commented on and which he supposed to have been written by wilson of the noctes ambrosien he says in this letter Quote, i like and admire w n and he should not have indulged himself in such outrageous license when he talks of lady byron's business he talks of what he knows nothing about and you may tell him no man can desire a public investigation of that affair more than i do he shortly after wrote and sent to murray a pamphlet for publication which was printed but not generally circulated till some time afterward though more than three years had elapsed since the separation the current against him at this time was so strong in england that his friends thought it best at first to use this article of lord byron's discreetly with influential persons rather than to give it to the public the writer in blackwood and the indignation of the english public of which that writer was the voice were now particularly stirred up by the appearance of the first two cantos of don juan in which the indecent caricature of lady byron was placed in vicinity with other indecencies the publication of which was justly considered an insult to a christian community it must here be mentioned for the honour of old england that at first she did her duty quite respectably in regard to don juan one can still read in murray's standard edition of the poems how every respectable press thundered reprobations which it would be well enough to print and circulate as tracts for our days byron it seems had thought of returning to england but he says in the letter we have quoted that he has changed his mind and shall not go back adding quote, i have finished the third canto of don juan but the things i have heard and read discourage all future publication you may try the copy question but you'll lose it the cry is up and the cant is up i should have no objection to return the price of the copyright and have written to mr Kinnaird on this subject end quote one sentence quoted by lord byron from the blackwood article will show the modern readers what the respectable world of that day were thinking and saying of him quote, it appears in short as if this miserable man 
having exhausted every species of sensual gratification having drained the cup of sin even to its bitterest dregs were resolved to show us that he is no longer a human being even in his frailties but a cool unconcerned fiend laughing with detestable glee over the whole of the better and worse elements of which human life is composed End quote. the defence which lord byron makes in his reply to that paper is of a man cornered and fighting for his life he speaks thus of the state of feeling at the time of his separation from his wife quote, i was accused of every monstrous vice by public rumour and a private rancour my name which had been a knightly or a noble one since my father's helped to conquer the kingdom for william the norman was tainted i felt that if what was whispered and muttered and murmured was true i was unfit for england if false england was unfit for me i withdrew but this was not enough in other countries in switzerland in the shadow of the alps and by the blue depth of the lakes i was pursued and breathed upon by the same blight i crossed the mountains but it was the same so i went a little farther and settled myself by the waves of the adriatic like a stag at bay who betakes him to the waters if i may judge by the statements of the few friends who gathered round me the outcry of the period to which i allude was beyond all precedent all parallel even in those cases where political motives have sharpened slander and doubled enmity i was advised not to go to the theatres lest i should be hissed nor to my duty in parliament lest i should be insulted by the way even on the day of my departure my most intimate friend told me afterwards that he was under the apprehension of violence from the people who might be assembled at the door of the carriage End quote now lord byron's charge against his wife was that she was directly responsible for getting up and keeping up this persecution which drove him from england that she did it in a deceitful treacherous manner which left him no chance of defending himself he charged against her that taking advantage of the time when his affairs were in confusion and an execution in the house she left him suddenly with treacherous profusions of kindness which were repeated by letters on the road and that soon after her arrival at her home her parents sent him word that she would never return to him and she confirmed the message that when he asked the reason why she refused to state any and that when this step gave rise to a host of slanders against him she silently encouraged and confirmed the slanders his claim was that he was denied from that time forth even the justice of any tangible accusation against himself which he might meet and refute he observes in the same article from which we have quoted when one tells me that i cannot in any way justify my own behaviour in that affair i acquiesce because no man can justify himself until he knows of what he is accused and i have never had and god knows my whole desire has ever been to obtain it any specific charge in a tangible shape submitted to me by the adversary nor by others unless the atrocities of public rumour and the mysterious silence of the lady's legal advisers may be deemed such lord byron his publishers friends and biographers thus agree in representing his wife as the secret author and a better of that persecution which it is claimed broke up his life and was the source of all his subsequent crimes and excesses lord byron wrote a poem in september eighteen sixteen in switzerland just after the separation in which he stated in so many words these accusations against his wife shortly after the poet's death murray published this poem together with the fair thee well and the lines to his sister under the title of domestic pieces in his standard edition of byron's poetry it is to be remarked then that this was for some time a private document shown to confidential friends and made use of judiciously as readers or listeners to his story were able to bear it lady byron then had a strong party in england sir samuel romilly and dr lushington were her counsel lady byron's parents were living and the appearance in the public prints of such a piece as this would have brought down an aggravated storm of public indignation 
for the general public such documents as fare thee well byron's poem to his wife were circulating in england and he frankly confessed his wife's virtues and his own sins to madame de stal and others in switzerland declaring himself to be in the wrong sensible of his errors and longing to cast himself at the feet of that serene perfection Quote, which wanted one sweet forgiveness to forgive End quote. But a little later he drew for his private partisans this bitter poetical indictment against her, which, as we have said, was used discreetly during his life and published after his death. Before we proceed to lay that poem before the reader, we shall refresh his memory with some particulars of the tragedy of Aeschylus, which Lord Byron selected as the exact parallel and proper illustration of his wife's treatment of himself in his letters and journals he often alludes to her as clytemnestra and the allusion has run the round of the thousand american papers lately and has been read by a thousand good honest people who had no very clear idea who clytemnestra was and what she did which was like the proceedings of lady byron according to the tragedy clytemnestra secretly hates her husband agamemnon whom she professes to love and wishes to put him out of the way that she may marry her lover aegisthus when her husband returns from the trojan war she receives him with pretended kindness and officiously offers to serve him at the bath inducing him to put on a garment of which she had adroitly sewed up the sleeves and neck so as to hamper the use of his arms she gives the signal to a concealed band of assassins who rush upon him and stab him clytemnestra is represented by aeschylus as grimly triumphing in her success which leaves her free to marry an adulterous paramour quoting byron's poem i did it too in such a cunning wise that he could neither scape nor ward off doom i staked around his steps an endless net as for the fishes End quote. in the piece entitled lines on hearing lady byron is ill lord byron charged on his wife a similar treachery and cruelty the whole poem is in murray's english edition volume four page two o seven of it we quote the following the reader will bear in mind that it is addressed to lady byron on a sick-bed i am too well avenged but twas my right whate'er my sins might be thou wert not sent to be the nemesis that should requite nor did heaven choose so near an instrument mercy is for the merciful if thou hast been of such twill be accorded now thy nights are banished from the realms of sleep for thou art pillowed on a curse too deep yes they may flatter thee but thou shalt feel a hollow agony that will not heal thou hast sown in my sorrow and must reap the bitter harvest in a woe as real i have had many foes but none like these for against the rest myself i could defend and be avenged or turn them into friend but thou in safe implacability hast not to dread in thy own weakness shielded and in my love which hath but too much yielded and spared for thy sake some i should not spare and thus upon the world trust in thy truth and the wild fame of my ungoverned youth on things that were not and on things that are even upon such a basis thou hast built a monument whose cement hath been guilt the moral clytemnestra of thy lord the hewed down with an unsuspected sword fame peace and hope and all that better life which but for this cold treason of thy heart might yet have risen from the grave of strife and found a nobler duty than to part but of thy virtues thou didst make a vice trafficking in them with a purpose cold and buying others woes at any price for present anger and for future gold and thus once entered into crooked ways the early truth that was thy proper praise did not still walk beside thee but at times and with a breast unknowing its own crimes deceits averments incompatible equivocations and the thoughts that dwell in janus spirits the significant eye that learns to lie with silence 
the pretext of prudence with advantages annexed the acquiescence in all things that tend no matter how to the desired end all found a place in thy philosophy the means were worthy and the end is one i would not do to thee as thou hast done End quote now if this language means anything it means in plain terms that whereas in her early days lady byron was peculiarly characterized by truthfulness she has in her recent dealings with him acted the part of a liar that she is not only a liar but that she lies for cruel means and malignant purposes that she is a moral assassin and her treatment of her husband has been like that of the most detestable murderess and adulteress of ancient history that she has learned to lie skillfully and artfully, that she equivocates, says incompatible things, and crosses her own tracks, that she is double-faced and has the art to lie even by silence, and that she has become wholly unscrupulous and acquiesces in anything, no matter what, that tends to the desired end, and that end the destruction of her husband. This is a brief summary of the story that Byron made it his life's business to spread through society, to propagate and make converts to during his life, and which has been in substance reasserted by Blackwood in a recent article this year. Now, the reader will please to notice that this poem is dated September 1816, and that on the 29th of March of that same year, he had thought proper to tell quite another story. At that time, the deed of separation was not signed. The negotiations between Lady Byron, acting by legal counsel, and himself were still pending. At that time, therefore, he was standing in a community who knew all he had said in former days of his wife's character, who were in an aroused and excited state by the fact that so lovely and good and patient a woman had actually been forced for some unexplained cause to leave him his policy at that time was to make large general confessions of sin and to praise and compliment her with a view of enlisting sympathy everybody feels for a handsome sinner weeping on his knees asking pardon for his offences against his wife in the public newspapers the celebrated fare thee well as we are told was written on the seventeenth of march and accidentally found its way into the newspapers at this time through the imprudence of a friend whom he allowed to take a copy these imprudent friends have all along been such a marvellous convenience to lord byron but the question met him on all sides what is the matter this wife you have declared the brightest sweetest most amiable of beings and against whose behaviour as a wife you actually never had nor can have a complaint to make why is she now all of a sudden so inflexibly set against you this question required an answer and he answered by writing another poem which also accidentally found its way into the public prints it is in his domestic pieces which the reader may refer to at the end of this volume and is called a sketch there was a most excellent respectable well-behaved englishwoman a mrs claremont who had been lady byron's governess in her youth and was still in mature life revered as her confidential friend it appears that this person had been with lady byron during a part of her married life especially the bitter hours of her lonely childbed when a young wife so much needs a sympathetic friend this mrs claremont was the person selected by lord byron at this time to be the scapegoat to bear away the difficulties of the case into the wilderness we are informed in moore's life what a noble pride of rank lord byron possessed and how when the headmaster of a school against whom he had a peak invited him to dinner he declined saying quote, to tell you the truth doctor if you should come to newstead i shouldn't think of inviting you to dine with me and so i don't care to dine with you here End quote. different countries it appears have different standards as to good taste moore gives this as an amusing instance of a young lord's spirit accordingly his first attack against this lady as we americans should call her consists in gross statements concerning her having been born poor and in an inferior rank 
byron begins by stating that she was quote, born in a garret in a kitchen bread promoted thence to deck her mistress head next for some gracious service unexpressed and from its wages only could be guessed raised from the toilet to the table where her wondering betters wait behind her chair with eye unmoved and forehead unabashed she dines from off the plate she lately washed quick with the tail and ready with the lie the genial confidant and general spy who could ye gods her next employment guess an only infant's earliest governess what had she made the pupil of her art none knows but that high soul secured the heart and panted for the truth it could not hear with longing soul and undeluded ear the poet here recognizes as a singular trait in lady byron her peculiar love of truth a trait which must have struck every one that had any knowledge of her through life he goes on now to give what he certainly knew to be the real character of lady byron Quote, foiled with perversion by that youthful mind which flattery fooled not baseness could not blind deceit infect not nor contagion soil indulgence weaken or example spoil nor mastered science tempt her to look down on humbler talent with a pitying frown nor genius swell nor beauty render vain nor envy ruffle to retaliate pain End quote. we are now informed that mrs clement whom he afterwards says in his letters was a spy of lady byron's mother set herself to make mischief between them he says quote, if early habits those strong links that bind at times the loftiest to the meanest mind have given her power too deeply to instil the angry essence of her deadly will if like a snake she steals within your walls till the black slime betray her as she crawls if like a viper to the heart she wind and leaves the venom there she did not find what marvel that this hag of hatred works eternal evil latent as she lurks the noble lord then proceeds to abuse this woman of inferior rank in the language of the upper circles he thus describes her person and manner quote, skilled by a touch to deepen scandal's tints with all the kind mendacity of hints while mingling truth with falsehood sneers with smiles a thread of candour with a web of wiles a plain blunt show of briefly spoken seeming to hide her bloodless heart's soul-hardened scheming a lip of lies a face formed to conceal and without feeling mock at all who feel with a vile mask the gorgon would disown a cheek of parchment and an eye of stone mark how the channels of her yellow blood ooze to her skin and stagnate there to mud cased like the centipede in saffron mail or darker greenness of the scorpion scale for drawn from reptiles only may we trace congenial colours in that soul or face look on her features and behold her mind as in a mirror of itself defined look on the picture deem it not o'ercharged there is no trait which might not be enlarged the poem thus ends quote, may the strong curse of crushed affections light back on thy bosom with reflected blight and make thee in thy leprosy of mind as loathsome to thyself as to mankind till all thy self-thoughts curdle into hate black as thy will for others would create till thy hard heart be calcined into dust and thy soul welter in its hideous crust oh may thy grave be sleepless as the bed the widowed couch of fire that thou hast spread then when thou fain wouldst weary heaven with prayer look on thy earthly victims and despair down to the dust and as thou rottest away even worms shall perish on thy poisonous clay but for the love i bore and still must bear to her thy malice from all ties would tear thy name thy human name to every eye the climax of all scorn should hang on high exalted o'er thy less abhorred compeers and festering in the infamy of years 
End quote. March 16th, 1816. Now, on the 29th of March, 1816, this was Lord Byron's story. He states that his wife had a truthfulness, even from early girlhood, that the most artful and unscrupulous governess could not pollute, that she always panted for truth, that flattery could not fool nor baseness blind her, that though she was a genius and master of science, she was yet gentle and tolerant, and one whom no envy could ruffle to retaliate pain in september of the same year she is a monster of unscrupulous deceit and vindictive cruelty now what had happened in the five months between the dates of these poems to produce such a change of opinion simply this first the negotiation between him and his wife's lawyers had ended in his signing a deed of separation in preference to standing a suit for divorce second madame de stal moved by his tears of anguish and professions of repentance had offered to negotiate with lady byron on his behalf and had failed the failure of this application is the only apology given by moore and murray for this poem which gentle thomas moore admits was not in quite as generous a strain as the fare thee well but lord byron knew perfectly well when he suffered the application to be made that lady byron had been entirely convinced that her marriage relations with him could never be renewed and that duty both to man and god required her to separate from him the allowing the negotiation was therefore an artifice to place his wife before the public in the attitude of a hard-hearted inflexible woman her refusal was what he knew beforehand must inevitably be the result and merely gave him capital in the sympathy of his friends by which they should be brought to tolerate and accept the bitter accusations of this poem we have recently heard it asserted that this last named piece of poetry was the sudden offspring of a fit of ill temper and was never intended to be published at all there were certainly excellent reasons why his friends should have advised him not to publish it at that time but that it was read with sympathy by the circle of his intimate friends and believed by them is evident from the frequency with which allusions to it occur in his confidential letters to them footnote in lady blessington's conversations with lord byron just before he went to greece she records that he gave her this poem in manuscript it was published in her journal and footnote about three months after under date march tenth eighteen seventeen he writes to moore Quote, I suppose now I shall never be able to shake off my sables in public imagination, more particularly since my moral blank clove down my fame. End quote. Again to Murray in 1819, three years after, he says, I never hear anything of Ada, the little Electra of Messenia. End quote electra was the daughter of clytemnestra in the greek poem who lived to condemn her wicked mother and to call on her brother to avenge the father there was in this mention of electra more than meets the ear many passages in lord byron's poetry show that he intended to make this daughter a future partisan against his mother and explain the awful words he is stated in lady anne barnard's diary to have used when he first looked on his little girl Quote, what an instrument of torture i have gained in you End quote. in a letter to lord blessington april sixth eighteen twenty three he says speaking of dr parr quote, he did me the honor once to be a patron of mine though a great friend of the other branch of the house of atreus and the greek teacher i believe of my moral climenestra i say moral because it is true and is so useful to the virtuous that it enables them to do anything without the aid of an aegisthus if lord byron wrote this poem merely in a momentary fit of spleen why were there so many persons evidently quite familiar with his allusions to it and why was it preserved in murray's hands and why published after his death that byron was in the habit of reposing documents in the hands of murray to be used as occasion offered is evident from a part of a note written by him to murray respecting some verses so entrusted 
pray let not these versiculi go forth with my name except to the initiated End quote. murray in publishing this attack on his wife after lord byron's death showed that he believed in it and so believing deemed lady byron a woman whose widowed state deserved neither sympathy nor delicacy of treatment at a time when every sentiment in the heart of the most deeply wronged woman would forbid her appearing to justify herself from such cruel slander of a dead husband an honest kind-hearted worthy englishman actually thought it right and proper to give these lines to her eyes and the eyes of all the reading world nothing can show more plainly what this poem was written for and how thoroughly it did its work considering byron as a wronged man murray thought he was contributing his might toward doing him justice his editor prefaced the whole set of domestic pieces with the following statements Quote, they all refer to the unhappy separation of which the precise causes are still a mystery and which he declared to the last were never disclosed to himself he admitted that pecuniary embarrassments disordered health and dislike to family restraints had aggravated his naturally violent temper and driven him to excesses he suspected that his mother-in-law had fomented the discord which lady byron denies and that more was due to the malignant offices of a female dependent who is the subject of the bitterly satirical sketch End quote. Quote, to these general statements can only be added the still vaguer allegations of lady byron that she conceived his conduct to be the result of insanity that the physician pronouncing him responsible for his actions she could submit to them no longer and that dr lushington her legal adviser agreed that a reconciliation was neither proper nor possible no weight can be attached to the opinions of an opposing counsel upon accusations made by one party behind the back of the other who urgently demanded and was pertinaciously refused the least opportunity of denial or defence he rejected the proposal for an amicable separation but consented when threatened with a suit in doctors commons End quote neither john murray nor any of byron's partisans seem to have pondered the admission in these last words here as appears was a woman driven to the last despair standing with her child in her arms asking from english laws protection for herself and child against her husband she had appealed to the first council in england and was acting under their direction two of the greatest lawyers in england have pronounced that there has been such a cause of offence on his part that a return to him is neither proper nor possible and that no alternative remains to her but separation or divorce he asks her to state her charges against him she making answer under advice of her counsel says quote, that if he insists on the specifications he must receive them in open court in a suit for divorce End quote what now ought to have been the conduct of any brave honest man who believed that his wife was taking advantage of her reputation for virtue to turn every one against him who saw that she had turned on her side even the lawyer he sought to retain on his footnote lord byron says in his observations on an article in blackwood quote, i recollect being much hurt by romilly's conduct he having a general retainer for me went over to the adversary alleging on being reminded of his retainer that he had forgotten it as his clerk had so many i observed that some of those who were now so eagerly laying the axe to my roof tree might see their own shaken his fell and crushed him End quote in the first edition of moore's life of lord byron there was printed a letter on sir samuel romilly so brutal that it was suppressed in the subsequent editions see part three of this book and footnote that she was an unscrupulous woman who acquiesced in every and anything to gain her ends while he stood before the public as he says accused of every monstrous vice by public rumour or private rancour when she under advice of her lawyers made the alternative legal separation or open investigation in court for divorce what did he do 
he signed the act of separation and left england now let any man who knows the legal mind of england let any lawyer who knows the character of sir samuel romilly and dr lushington ask whether they were the men to take a case into court for a woman that had no evidence but her own statements and impressions were they men to go to trial without proofs did they not know that there were artful hysterical women in the world and would they of all people be the men to take a woman's story on her own side and advise her in the last issue to bring it into open court without legal proof of the strongest kind now as long as sir samuel romilly lived this statement of byron's that he was condemned unheard and had no chance of knowing whereof he was accused never appeared in public it however was most actively circulated in private that byron was in the habit of entrusting to different confidants articles of various kinds to be shown to different circles as they could bear them we have already shown we have recently come upon another instance of this kind in the late eagerness to exculpate byron a new document has turned up of which mr murray it appears had never heard when after byron's death he published in the preface of his domestic pieces the sentence quote, he rejected the proposal for an amicable separation but consented when threatened with a suit in doctor's commons End quote. it appears that up to eighteen fifty three neither john murray senior nor the son who now fills his place had taken any notice of this newly found document which we are now informed was drawn up by lord byron in august eighteen seventeen while mr hobhouse was staying with him at la mira near venice given to mr matthew gregory lewis for circulation among friends in england found in mr lewis's papers after his death and now in the possession of mr murray here it is Quote, it has been intimated to me that the persons understood to be the legal advisers of lady byron have declared their lips to be sealed up on the cause of the separation between her and myself if their lips are sealed up they are not sealed up by me and the greatest favour they can confer on me will be to open them from the first hour in which i was apprised of the intentions of the noel family to the last communication between lady byron and myself in the character of wife and husband a period of some months i called repeatedly and in vain for a statement of their or her charges and it was chiefly in consequence of lady byron's claiming in a letter still existing a promise on my part to consent to a separation if such was really her wish that i consented at all this claim and the exasperating and expiable manner in which their object was pursued which rendered it next to an impossibility that two persons so divided could ever be reunited induced me reluctantly then and repentantly still to sign the deed which i shall be happy most happy to cancel and go before any tribunal which may discuss the business in the most public manner mr hobhouse made this proposition on my part viz to abrogate all prior intentions and go into court the very day before the separation was signed and it was declined by the other party as also the publication of the correspondence during the previous discussion those propositions i beg here to repeat and to call upon her and hers to say their worst pledging myself to meet their allegations whatever they may be and only too happy to be informed at last of their real nature signed byron august ninth eighteen seventeen p s i have been and am now utterly ignorant of what description her allegations charges or whatever name they may have assumed are and am as little aware of what purpose they have been kept back unless it was to sanction the most infamous calumnies by silence byron lemira near venice it appears the circulation of this document must have been very private since more not over delicate towards lord byron did not think fit to print it since john murray neglected it and since it has come out at this late hour for the first time if lord byron really desired lady byron and her legal counsel to understand the facts herein stated and was willing at all hazards to bring on an open examination why was this privately circulated 
why not issued as a card in the london papers is it likely that mr matthew gregory lewis and a chosen band of friends acting as a committee requested an audience with lady byron sir samuel romilly and dr lushington and formally presented this cartel of defiance we incline to think not we incline to think that this small serpent in company with many others of like kind crawled secretly and privately around and when it found a good chance bit an honest briton whose blood was thenceforth poisoned by an undetected falsehood this ends chapter two part one of two the attack on lady byron part one chapter two part two of lady byron vindicated by harriet beecher stowe this librivox recording is in the public domain read for you by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana chapter two the attack on lady byron part two the reader may now turn to the letters that mr moore has thought fit to give us of this stay at lamira beginning with letter two eighty six dated july first eighteen seventeen where byron says i have been working up my impressions into a fourth canto of child harold and also mr lewis is in venice i am going up to stay a week with him there End quote. next under date lamira venice july tenth he says monk lewis is here how pleasant next under date july twentieth eighteen seventeen to mr murray i write to give you notice that i have completed the fourth and ultimate canto of child harold it is yet to be copied and polished and the notes are to come under date of la mira august seventh eighteen seventeen he records that the new canto is one hundred and thirty stanzas in length and talks about the price for it he is now ready to launch it on the world and as now appears on august ninth eighteen seventeen two days after he wrote the document above cited and put it into the hands of mr lewis as we are informed for circulation among friends in england the reason of this may now be evident having prepared a suitable number of those whom he calls in his notes to murray the initiated by private documents and statements he is now prepared to publish his accusations against his wife and the story of his wrongs in a great immortal poem which shall have a band of initiated interpreters shall be read through the civilized world and stand to accuse her after his death in the fourth canto of child harold with all his own overwhelming power of language he sets forth his cause as against the silent woman who all this time had been making no party and telling no story and whom the world would therefore conclude to be silent because she had no answer to make i remember well the time when this poetry so resounding in its music so mournful so apparently generous filled my heart with a vague anguish of sorrow for the sufferer and of indignation at the cold insensibility that had maddened him thousands have felt the power of this great poem which stands and must stand to all time a monument of what sacred and solemn powers god gave to this wicked man and how vilely he abused this power as a weapon to slay the innocent it is among the ruins of ancient rome that his voice breaks forth in solemn imprecation Quote, o time thou beautifier of the dead adorner of the rain comforter and only healer where the heart hath bled time the corrector when our judgments err the test of truth love soul philosopher for all besides are sophists from thy shrift that never loses though it doth defer time the avenger unto thee i lift my hands and heart and eyes and claim of thee a gift if thou hast ever seen me too elate hear me not but if calmly i have borne good and reserved my pride against the hate which shall not whelm me let me not have worn this iron in my soul in vain they shall not mourn 
and thou who never yet of human wrong left the unbalanced scale great nemesis here where the ancients paid their worship long thou who didst call the furies from the abyss and round orestes bid them howl and hiss for that unnatural retribution just had it but come from hands less near in this thy former realm i call thee from the dust dost thou not hear my heart awake thou shalt and must for it is not that i may not have incurred for my ancestral faults and mine the wound wherewith i bleed withal and had it been conferred with a just weapon it had flowed unbound but now my blood shall not sink in the ground but in this page a record will i seek not in the air shall these my words disperse though i be ashes a far hour shall wreak the deep prophetic fullness of this verse and pile on human heads the mountain of my curse the curse shall be forgiveness have i not hear me my mother earth behold it heaven have i not had to wrestle with my lot have i not suffered things to be forgiven have i not had my brain seared my heart riven hopes sapped name blighted life's life lied away and only not to desperation driven because not altogether of such clay as rots into the soul of those whom i survey from mighty wrongs to petty perfidy have i not seen what human things could do from the loud roar of foaming calumny to the small whispers of the paltry few and subtler venom of the reptile crew the janus glance of whose significant eye learning to lie with silence would seem true and without utterance save the shrug or sigh deal round to happy fools its speechless obloquy the reader will please notice that the lines in italics are almost word for word a repetition of the lines in italics in the former poem on his wife where he speaks of a significant eye that has learned to lie in silence and were evidently meant to apply to lady byron and her small circle of confidential friends before this in the third canto of child harold he had claimed the sympathy of the world as a loving father deprived by a severe fate of the solace and society of his only child my daughter with this name my song began my daughter with this name my song shall end i see thee not and hear thee not but none can be so rapt in thee thou art the friend to whom the shadows of far years extend to aid thy mind's developments to watch the dawn of little joys to sit and see almost thy very growth to view thee catch knowledge of objects wonders yet to thee and print on thy soft cheek a parent's kiss this it should seem was not reserved for me yet this was in my nature as it is i know not what there is yet something like to this yet though dull hate as duty should be taught i know that thou wilt love me though my name should be shut out from thee as spell till fraught with desolation and a broken claim though the grave close between us twere the same i know that thou wilt love me though to drain my blood from out thy being were an aim and an attainment all will be in vain to all these charges against her send all over the world in verses as eloquent as the english language is capable of the wife replied nothing assailed by slander and the tongue of strife her only answer was a blameless life she had a few friends a very few with whom she sought solace and sympathy one letter from her written at this time preserved by accident is the only authentic record of how the matter stood with her we regret to say that the publication of this document was not brought forth to clear lady byron's name from her husband's slanders but to shield him from the worst accusation against him by showing that this crime was not included in the few private confidential revelations that friendship wrung from the young wife at this period lady anne barnard authoress of old robin gray a friend whose age and experience made her a proper confidant sent for the broken-hearted perplexed wife and offered her a woman's sympathy 
to her lady byron wrote many letters under seal of confidence and lady anne says quote, i will give you a few paragraphs transcribed from one of lady byron's own letters to me it is sorrowful to think that in a very little time this young and amiable creature wise patient and feeling will have her character mistaken by every one who reads byron's works to rescue her from this i preserved her letters and when she afterwards expressed a fear that anything of her writing should ever fall into hands to injure him i suppose she meant by publication i safely assured her that it never should but here this letter shall be placed a sacred record in her favour unknown to herself Quote, i am a very incompetent judge of the impression which the last canto of child harold may produce on the minds of indifferent readers it contains the usual trace of a conscience restlessly awake though his object has been too long to aggravate its burdens as if it could thus be oppressed into eternal stupor i will hope as you do that it survives for his ultimate good it was the acuteness of his remorse impenitent in its character which so long seemed to demand from my companion to spare every semblance of reproach every look of grief which might have said to his conscience you have made me wretched i am decidedly of opinion that he is responsible he has wished to be thought partially deranged or on the brink of it to perplex observers and prevent them from tracing effects to their real causes through all the intricacies of his conduct i was as i told you at one time the dupe of his active insanity and clung to the former delusions in regard to the motives that concerned me personally till the whole system was laid bare he is the absolute monarch of words and uses them as bonaparte did lives for conquest without more regard to their intrinsic value considering them only as ciphers which must derive all their import from the situation in which he places them and the ends to which he adapts them with such consummate skill why then you will say does he not employ them to give a better colour to his own character because he is too good an actor to overact or to assume a moral garb which it would be easy to strip off in regard to his poetry egotism is the vital principle of his imagination which it is difficult for him to kindle on any subject with which his own character and interests are not identified but by the introduction of fictitious incidents by change of scene or time he has enveloped his poetical disclosures in a system impenetrable except to a very few and his constant desire of creating a sensation makes him not averse to be the object of wonder and curiosity even though accompanied by some dark and vague suspicions nothing has contributed more to the misunderstanding of his real character than the lonely grandeur in which he shrouds it and his affectation of being above mankind when he exists almost in their voice the romance of his sentiments is another feature of this mask of state i know no one more habitually destitute of that enthusiasm he so beautifully expresses and to which he can work up his fancy chiefly by contagion i had heard he was the best of brothers the most generous of friends and i thought such feelings only required to be warmed and cherished into more diffusive benevolence though these opinions are eradicated and could never return but with the decay of my memory you will not wonder if there are still moments when the association of feelings which arose from them soften and sadden my thoughts but i have not thanked you dearest lady anne for your kindness in regard to the principal object that of rectifying false impressions i trust you understand my wishes which never were to injure lord byron in any way for though he would not suffer me to remain his wife he cannot prevent me from continuing his friend and it was from considering myself as such that i silenced the accusations by which my own conduct might have been more fully justified it is not necessary to speak ill of his heart in general it is sufficient that to me it was hard and impenetrable that my own must have been broken before his could have been touched i would rather represent this as my misfortune than as his guilt but surely that misfortune is not to be made a crime such are my feelings you will judge how to act 
his allusions to me in child harold are cruel and cold but with such a semblance as to make me appear so and to attract all sympathy to himself it is said in this poem that hatred of him will be taught as a lesson to his child i might appeal to all who have ever heard me speak of him and still more to my own heart to witness that there has been no moment when i have remembered injury otherwise than affectionately and sorrowfully it is not my duty to give way to hopeless and wholly unrequited affection but so long as i live my chief struggle will probably be not to remember him too kindly i do not seek the sympathy of the world but i wish to be known by those whose opinion is valuable and whose kindness is dear to me among such my dear lady anne you will ever be remembered by your true and affectionate annabel byron on this letter i observe lord lindsay remarks that it shows a noble but rather severe character and a recent author has remarked that it seemed to be written rather in a cold spirit of criticism it seems to strike these gentlemen as singular that lady byron did not enjoy the poem but there are two remarkable sentences in this letter which have escaped the critics hitherto lord byron in this the third canto of child harold expresses in most affecting words an enthusiasm of love for his sister so long as he lived he was her faithful correspondent he sent her his journals and dying he left her and her children everything he had in the world this certainly seems like an affectionate brother but in what words does lady byron speak of this affection Quote, i had heard he was the best of brothers the most generous of friends i thought these feelings only required to be warmed and cherished into more diffusive benevolence these opinions are eradicated and could never return but with the decay of memory let me ask those who give this letter as a proof that at this time no idea such as i stated was in lady byron's mind to account for these words let them please answer these questions why had lady byron ceased to think him a good brother why does she use so strong a word as that the opinion was eradicated torn up by the roots and could never grow again in her except by decay of memory and yet this is a document lord lindsay vouches for as authentic and which he brings forward in defence of lord byron again she says quote, though he would not suffer me to remain his wife he cannot prevent me from continuing his friend end quote. do these words not say that in some past time in some decided manner lord byron had declared to her his rejection of her as a wife i shall yet have occasion to explain these words again she says quote, i silenced accusations by which my conduct might have been more fully justified end quote the people in england who are so very busy in searching out evidence against my true story have searched out and given to the world an important confirmation of this assertion of lady byron's it seems that the confidential waiting-maid who went with lady byron on her wedding journey has been sought out and interrogated and as appears by description is a venerable respectable old person quite in possession of all her senses in general and of that sixth sense of propriety in particular which appears not to be a common virtue in our days as her testimony is important we insert it just here with a description of her person in full the ardent investigators thus speak quote, having gained admission we were shown into a small but neatly furnished and scrupulously clean apartment where sat the object of our visit mrs mims is a venerable looking old lady of short stature slight and active appearance with a singularly bright and intelligent countenance although midway between eighty and ninety years of age she is in full possession of her faculties discourses freely and cheerfully hears apparently as well as ever she did and her sight is so good that aided by a pair of spectacles she reads the chronicle every day with ease some idea of her competency to contribute valuable evidence to the subject which now so much engages public attention on three continents may be found from her own narrative of her personal relations with lady byron mrs mims was born in the neighbourhood of seaham and knew lady byron from childhood 
during the long period of ten years she was miss milbank's lady-maid and in that capacity became the close confidant of her mistress there were circumstances which rendered their relationship peculiarly intimate miss milbank had no sister or female friend to whom she was bound by the ties of more than a common affection and her mother whatever other excellent qualities she may have possessed was too high-spirited and too hasty in temper to attract the sympathies of the young some months before miss milbank was married to lord byron mrs mims had quitted her service on the occasion of her own marriage with mr mims but she continued to reside in the neighbourhood of seaham and remained on the most friendly terms with the former mistress as the courtship proceeded miss milbank concealed nothing from her faithful attendant and when the wedding day was fixed she begged mrs mims to return and fulfil the duties of lady's maid at least during the honeymoon mrs mims at the time was nursing her first child and it was no small sacrifice to quit her own home at such a moment but she could not refuse her old mistress's request accordingly she returned to seaham hall some days before the wedding was present at the ceremony and then preceded lord and lady byron to how nabby hall near croft in the north riding of yorkshire one of sir ralph milbank's seats where the newly married couple were to spend the honeymoon mrs mims remained with lord and lady byron during the three weeks they spent at hal nabby hall and then accompanied them to seaham where they spent the next six weeks it was during the latter period that she finally quitted lady byron's service but she remained in the most friendly communication with her ladyship till the death of the latter and for some time was living in the neighbourhood of lady byron's residence in leicestershire where she had frequent opportunities of seeing her former mistress it may be added that lady byron was not unmindful of the faithful services of her friend and attendant in the instructions to her executors contained in her will such was the position of mrs mims towards lady byron and we think no one will question that it was of a nature to entitle all that mrs mims may say on the subject of the relations of lord and lady byron to the most respectful consideration and credit such is the chronicler's account of the faithful creature whom nothing but intense indignation and disgust at mrs beecher stowe would lead to speak on her mistress's affairs but mrs beecher stowe feels none the less sincere respect for her and is none the less obliged to her for having spoken much of mrs mims's testimony will be referred to in another place we only extract one passage to show that while lord byron spent his time in setting afloat slanders against his wife she spent hers in sealing the mouths of witnesses against him of the period of the honeymoon mrs mims says Quote, the happiness of lady byron however was of brief duration even during the short three weeks they spent at hal nabby the irregularities of lord byron occasioned her the greatest distress and she even contemplated returning to her father mrs mims was her constant companion and confidant through this painful period and she does not believe that her ladyship concealed a thought from her with laudable reticence the old lady absolutely refuses to disclose the particulars of lord byron's misconduct at this time she gave lady byron a solemn promise not to do so so serious did mrs mims consider the conduct of lord byron that she recommended her mistress to confide all the circumstances to her father sir ralph milbank a calm kind and most excellent parent and take his advice as to her future course at one time mrs mims thinks lady byron had resolved to follow her counsel and impart her wrongs to sir ralph but on arriving at seaham hall her ladyship strictly enjoined mrs mims to preserve absolute silence on the subject a course which she followed herself so that when six weeks later she and lord byron left seaham for london not a word had escaped her to disturb her parents tranquillity as to their daughter's domestic happiness as might be expected mrs mims bears the warmest testimony to the noble and lovable qualities of her departed mistress she also declares that lady byron was by no means of cold temperament but that the affectionate impulses of her nature were checked by the unkind treatment she experienced from her husband End quote. 
we have already shown that lord byron had been ever since his separation engaged in a systematic attempt to reverse the judgment of the world against himself by making converts of all his friends to the most odious view of his wife's character and inspiring them with the zeal of propagandists to spread these views through society we have seen how he prepared partisans to interpret the fourth canto of child harold this plan of solemn and heroic accusation was the first public attack on his wife next we see him commencing a scurrilous attempt to turn her to ridicule in the first canto of don juan it is to our point now to show how carefully and cautiously this don juan campaign was planned volume four page one thirty eight we find letter three twenty five to mr murray venice january twenty fifth eighteen nineteen Quote, you will do me the favor to print privately for private distribution fifty copies of don juan the list of the men to whom i wish it presented i will send hereafter End quote. the poem as will be remembered begins with the meanest and foulest attack on his wife that ever ribald wrote and puts it in close neighborhood with scenes which every pure man or woman must feel to be the beastly utterances of a man who has lost all sense of decency such a potion was too strong to be administered even in a time when great license was allowed and men were not over nice but byron chooses fifty armor-bearers of that class of men who would find indecent ribaldry about a wife a good joke and talk about the artistic merits of things which we hope would make an honest boy blush at this time he acknowledges that his vices had brought him to a state of great exhaustion attended by his debility of the stomach that nothing remained on it and adds i was obliged to reform my way of life which was conducting me from the yellow leaf to the ground with all deliberate speed End quote but as his health is a little better he employs it in making the way to death and hell elegantly easy for other young men by breaking down the remaining scruples of a society not over scrupulous society revolted however and fought stoutly against the nauseous dose his sister wrote to him that she heard such things said of it that she never would read it and the outcry against it on the part of all women of his acquaintance was such that for a time he was quite overborne and the countess guiccioli finally extorted a promise from him to cease writing it nevertheless there came a time when england accepted don juan when wilson in the noctes ambrosiennes praised it as a classic and took every opportunity to reprobate lady byron's conduct when first it appeared the blackwood came out with that indignant denunciation of which we have spoken and to which byron replied in the extracts we have already quoted he did something more than reply he marked out wilson as one of the strongest literary men of the day and set his initiated with their documents to work upon him one of these documents to which he requested wilson's attention was the private autobiography written expressly to give his own story of all the facts of the marriage and separation in the indignant letter he writes murray on the blackwood article volume four letter three hundred and fifty under date december tenth eighteen nineteen he says quote, i send home for more and for more only who has my journal also my memoirs written up to eighteen sixteen and i gave him leave to show it to whom he pleased but not to publish on any account you may read it and you may let wilson read it if he likes not for his public opinion but his private for i like the man and care very little about the magazine and i could wish lady byron herself to read it that she may have it in her power to mark anything mistaken or misstated as it will never appear till after my extinction it would be but fair she should see it that is to say herself willing your blackwood accuses me of treating women harshly but i have been their martyr my whole life has been sacrificed to them and by them End quote. it was a part of byron's policy to place lady byron in positions before the world where she could not speak and where her silence would be set down to her as haughty stony indifference and obstinacy 
such was the pretended negotiation through madame de stal and such now this apparently fair and generous offer to let lady byron see and mark this manuscript the little ada is now in her fifth year a child of singular sensibility and remarkable mental powers one of those exceptional children who are so perilous a charge for a mother her husband proposes this artful snare to her that she shall mark what is false in a statement which is all built on a damning lie that she cannot refute over that daughter's head and which would perhaps be her ruin to discuss hence came an addition of two more documents to be used privately among friends footnote lord byron took especial pains to point out to murray the importance of these two letters volume five letter four four three he says quote, you must also have from mr moore the correspondence between me and lady b to whom i offered a sight of all that concerns herself in these papers this is important he has her letter and my answer and footnote and which blackwood uses after lady byron is safely out of the world to cast ignominy on her grave the wife's letter that of a mother standing at bay for her daughter knowing that she is dealing with a desperate powerful unscrupulous enemy she writes to lord byron kirkby mallory march tenth eighteen twenty i received your letter of january first offering to my perusal a memoir of part of your life i decline to inspect it i consider the publication or circulation of such a composition at any time as prejudicial to ada's future happiness for my own sake i have no reason to shrink from publication but notwithstanding the injuries which i have suffered i should lament some of the consequences annabel byron End quote lord byron writing for the public as is his custom makes reply ravina april third eighteen twenty quote, i received yesterday your answer dated march tenth my offer was an honest one and surely could only be construed as such even by the most malignant casuistry i could answer you but it is too late and it is not worth it to the mysterious menace of the last sentence whatever its import may be and i cannot pretend to unriddle it i could hardly be very sensible even if i understood it as before it can take place i shall be where quote, nothing can touch him further end quote i advise you however to anticipate the period of your intention for be assured no power of figures can avail beyond the present and if it could i would answer with the florentine edio che posto son con loro in croce e certo la fiera moglie più che altro mi nuoce footnote dante's inferno canto sixteen longfellow's translation and i who with them on the cross am placed truly my savage wife more than aught else doth harm me End footnote. byron to lady byron End quote. two things are very evident in this correspondence lady byron intimates that if he publishes his story some consequences must follow which she shall regret lord byron receives this as a threat and says he doesn't understand it but directly after he says before it can take place i shall be etc the intimation is quite clear he does understand what the consequences alluded to are they are evidently that lady byron will speak out and tell her story he says she cannot do this till after he is dead and then he shall not care in allusion to her accuracy as to dates and figures he says be assured no power of figures can avail beyond the present life and then ironically advises her to anticipate the period i e to speak out while he is alive in volume six letter five eighteen which lord byron wrote to lady byron but did not send he says quote, i burned your last note for two reasons firstly because it was written in a style not very agreeable and secondly because i wished to take your word without documents which are the resources of worldly and suspicious people End quote. 
it would appear from this that there was a last letter of lady byron to her husband which he did not think proper to keep on hand or showed to the initiated with his usual unreserve that this letter contained some kind of pledge for which he preferred to take her word without documents each reader can imagine for himself what that pledge might have been but from the tenor of the three letters we should infer that it was a promise of silence for his lifetime on certain conditions and that the publication of the autobiography would violate those conditions and make it her duty to speak out this celebrated autobiography forms so conspicuous a figure in the whole history that the reader must have a full idea of it as given by byron himself in volume four letter three hundred and forty four to murray Quote, i gave to moore who has gone to rome my life in manuscript in seventy-eight folio sheets brought down to eighteen sixteen also a journal kept in eighteen fourteen neither are for publication during my life but when i am cold you may do what you please in the meantime if you like to read them you may and show them to anybody you like i care not he tells him also quote, you will find in it a detailed account of my marriage and its consequences as true as a party concerned can make such an account End quote. of the extent to which this autobiography was circulated we have the following testimony of shelton mackenzie in notes to the noctis of june eighteen twenty four in the noctis o'doherty says Quote, the fact is the work had been copied for the private reading of a great lady in florence the note says the great lady in florence for whose private reading byron's autobiography was copied was the countess of westmoreland lady blessington had the autobiography in her possession for weeks and confessed to having copied every line of it moore remonstrated and she committed her copy to the flames but did not tell him that her sister mrs holm purvis now viscountess of canterbury had also made a copy from the quantity of copy i have seen and others were more in the way of falling in with it than myself i surmise that at least half a dozen copies were made and of these five are now in existence some particular parts such as the marriage and separation were copied separately but i think there cannot be less than five full copies yet to be found this was written after the original autobiography was burned we may see the zeal and enthusiasm of the byron party copying sixty-eight folio sheets as of old christians copied the gospels how widely fully and thoroughly thus by this secret process was society saturated with byron's own version of the story that related to himself and wife against her there was only the complaint of an absolute silence she put forth no statements no documents had no party sealed the lips of her counsel and even of her servants yet she could not but have known from time to time how thoroughly and strongly this web of mingled truth and lies was being meshed around her steps from the time that byron first saw the importance of securing wilson on his side and wrote to have his partisans attend to him we may date an entire revolution in the blackwood it became byron's warmest supporter and to this day the bitterest accuser of his wife why was this wonderful silence it appears that dr lushington's statements that when lady byron did speak she had a story to tell that powerfully affected both him and romilly a story supported by evidence on which they were willing to have gone to public trial supposing now she had imitated lord byron's example and avoiding public trial had put her story into private circulation as he sent don juan to fifty confidential friends suppose she had sent a written statement of her story to fifty judges as intelligent as the two that had heard it or suppose she had confronted his autobiography with her own what would have been the result the first result might have been mrs lee's utter ruin the world may finally forgive the man of genius anything but for a woman there is no mercy and no redemption this ruin lady byron prevented by her utter silence and great self-command mrs lee never lost position lady byron never so varied in her manner towards her 
as to excite the suspicions even of her confidential old servant to protect mrs lee effectively it must have been necessary to continue to exclude even her own mother from the secret as we are assured she did at first for had she told lady milbank it is not possible that so high-spirited a woman could have retained herself from such outward expressions as would at least have awakened suspicion there was no resource but this absolute silence lady blessington in her last conversation with lord byron thus describes the life lady byron was leading she speaks of her as wearing away her youth in almost monastic seclusion questioned by some appreciated by a few seeking consolation alone in the discharge of her duties and avoiding all external demonstrations of a grief that her pale cheek and solitary existence alone were vouchers for the main object of all this silence may be imagined if we remember that if lord byron had not died had he truly and deeply repented and become a thoroughly good man and returned to england to pursue a course worthy of his powers there was on record neither word nor deed from his wife to stand in his way his place was kept in society ready for him to return to whenever he came clothed and in his right mind he might have had the heart and confidence of his daughter unshadowed by a suspicion he might have won the reverence of the great and good in his own lands and all lands that hope which was the strong support the prayer of the silent wife it did not please god to fulfil lord byron died a worn-out man at thirty-six but the bitter seeds he had sown came up after his death in a harvest of thorns over his grave and there were not wanting hands to use them as instruments of torture on the heart of his widow this ends chapter two part two the attack on lady byron part one chapter three of lady byron vindicated a history of the byron controversy by harriet beecher stowe this librivox recording is in the public domain read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana chapter three resume of the conspiracy we have traced the conspiracy of lord byron against his wife up to its latest device that the reader's mind may be clear on the points of the process we shall now briefly recapitulate the documents in the order of time one march seventeenth eighteen sixteen while negotiations for separation were pending fare thee well and if forever while writing these pages we have received from england the testimony of one who has seen the original draft of that fare thee well this original copy had evidently been subjected to the most careful and acute revision scarcely two lines that were not interlined scarcely an adjective that was not exchanged for a better showing that the noble lord was not so far overcome by grief as to have forgotten his reputation found its way to the public prints through the imprudence of a friend two march twenty ninth eighteen sixteen an attack on lady byron's old governess for having been born poor for being homely and for having unduly influenced his wife against him promising that her grave should be a fiery bed and also praising his wife's perfect and remarkable truthfulness and discernment that made it impossible for flattery to fool or baseness blind her but ascribing all his woes to her being fooled and blinded by this same governess found its way to the prince by the imprudence of a friend three september eighteen sixteen lines on hearing that lady byron is ill calls her a clytemnestra who has secretly set assassins on her lord says she is a mean treacherous deceitful liar and has entirely departed from her early truth and become the most unscrupulous and unprincipled of women never printed till after lord byron's death but circulated privately among the initiated four august ninth eighteen seventeen gives to m g lewis a paper for circulation among friends in england stating that what he most wants is public investigation which has always been denied him and daring lady byron and her counsel to come out publicly 
found in m g lewis's portfolio after his death never heard of before except among the initiated having given m g lewis's document time to work january eighteen eighteen gives the fourth canto of child harold to the public january twenty fifth eighteen nineteen sends to murray to print for private circulation among the initiated the first canto of don juan is nobly and severely rebuked for this insult to his wife by the blackwood august eighteen nineteen october eighteen nineteen gives more the manuscript autobiography with leave to show it to whom he pleases and print it after his death october twenty ninth eighteen nineteen volume four letter three hundred and forty four writes to murray that he may read all this autobiography and show it to anybody he likes december tenth eighteen nineteen writes to murray on this article in blackwood against don juan and himself which he supposes written by wilson sends a complimentary message to wilson and asks him to read his autobiography sent by moore letter three hundred and fifty march fifteenth eighteen twenty writes and dedicates to i disraeli esq a vindication of himself in reply to the blackwood on don juan containing an indignant defence of his own conduct in relation to his wife and maintaining that he never yet has had an opportunity of knowing whereof he has been accused accusing sir s romilly of taking his retainer and then going over to the adverse party etc printed for private circulation to be found in the standard english edition of murray volume nine page fifty seven to this condensed account of byron's strategy we must add the crowning stroke of policy which transmitted this warfare to his friends to be continued after his death during the last visit moore made him in italy and just before byron presented to him his autobiography the following scene occurred as narrated by moore volume four page two hundred and twenty one quote, the chief subject of conversation when alone was his marriage and the load of obloquy which it had brought upon him he was most anxious to know the worst that had been alleged of his conduct and as this was our first opportunity of speaking together on the subject i did not hesitate to put his candour most searchingly to the proof not only by enumerating the various charges i had heard brought against him by others but by specifying such portions of these charges as i had been inclined to think not incredible myself to all this he listened with patience and answered with the most unhesitating frankness laughing to scorn the tales of unmanly outrage related of him but at the same time acknowledging that there had been in his conduct but too much to blame and regret and stating one or two occasions during his domestic life when he had been irritated into letting the breath of bitter words escape him which he now evidently remembered with a degree of remorse and pain which might well have entitled them to be forgotten by others it was at the same time manifest that whatever admissions he might be inclined to make respecting his own delinquencies the inordinate measure of the punishment dealt out to him had sunk deeply into his mind and with the usual effect of such injustice drove him also to be unjust himself so much so indeed as to impute to the quarter to which he now traced all his ill fate a feeling of fixed hostility to himself which would not rest he thought even at his grave but continued to persecute his memory as it was now embittering his life so strong was this impression upon him that during one of our few intervals of seriousness he conjured me by our friendship as if he both felt and hoped i should survive him not to let unmerited censure settle upon his name in this same account page two hundred and eighteen moore testifies that quote, lord byron disliked his countrymen but only because he knew that his morals were held in contempt by them the english themselves rigid observers of family duties could not pardon him the neglect of his nor his trampling on principles therefore neither did he like being presented to them nor did they especially when they had wives with them like to cultivate his acquaintance 
still there was a strong desire in all of them to see him and the women in particular who did not dare to look at him but by stealth said in an undervoice what a pity it is if however any of his compatriots of exalted rank and high reputation came forth to treat him with courtesy he showed himself obviously flattered by it it seemed that to the wound which remained open in his ulcerated heart such soothing attentions were as drops of healing balm which comforted him when in society we are further informed by a lady quoted by mr moore byron was in the habit of speaking of his wife with much respect and affection as an illustrious lady distinguished for her qualities of heart and understanding saying that all the fault of their cruel separation lay with himself mr moore seems at times to be somewhat puzzled by these contradictory statements of his idol and speculates not a little on what could be lord byron's object in using such language in public mentally comparing it we suppose with the free handling which he gave to the same subject in his private correspondence the innocence with which moore gives himself up to be manipulated by lord byron the naivete with which he shows all the process let us a little into the secret of the marvellous powers of charming and blinding which this great actor possessed lord byron had the beauty the wit the genius the dramatic talent which have constituted the strength of some wonderfully fascinating women there have been women able to lead their leashes of blinded adorers to make them swear that black was white or white black at their word to smile away their senses or weep away their reason no matter what these sirens may say no matter what they may do though caught in a thousand transparent lies and doing a thousand deeds which would have ruined others still men madly rave after them in life and tear their hair over their graves such an enchanter in man's shape was lord byron he led captive moore and murray by being beautiful a genius and a lord calling them dear tom and dear murray while they were only commoners he first insulted sir walter scott and then witched his heart out of him by ingenious confessions and poetical compliments he took wilson's heart by flattering messages and a beautifully written letter he corresponded familiarly with hogg and before his death he made fast friends in one way or another of the whole noctes ambrosian club we thus have given the historical resume of lord byron's attacks on his wife's reputation we shall add that they were based on philosophic principles showing a deep knowledge of mankind an analysis will show that they can be philosophically classified first those which addressed the sympathetic nature of man representing her as cold methodical severe strict unforgiving second those addressed to the faculty of association connecting her with ludicrous and licentious images taking from her the usual protection of womanly delicacy and sacredness third those addressed to the moral faculties accusing her as artful treacherous untruthful malignant all these various devices he held in his hand shuffling and dealing them as a careful gangster his pack of cards according to the exigencies of the game he played adroitly skilfully with blinding flatteries and seductive wiles that made his victims willing dupes nothing can more clearly show the power and perfectness of his enchantments than the masterly way in which he turned back the moral force of the whole english nation which had risen at first in its strength against him the victory was complete this ends chapter three resume of the conspiracy